The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello, and welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Derek, and in today's episode, I'll be building a multi-phone intercom system or party line with rudimentary dialing capability. The beauty of this circuit is that it utilizes any old landline phone without modification and uses a DTMF decoder to individually address and ring one or more telephones. Sound interesting? Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. So why build this project anyways? Well, aside from wanting to tell my kids to complete their chores from my office, I have fond memories before cell phones became affordable and widespread. You see, long ago, when popped collars and Miami Vice were a thing, a family had only one or two phones around the house connected to a single shared landline. Those were the days where in order to get any privacy, you had to stretch the phone cord from the kitchen wall across the room and under your bedroom door in hopes that no one else picked up another line while whispering sweet nothings to your significant other. It was an inconvenience, but there's still something satisfying about wedging a phone between your head and shoulder while typing up a script for your next Element 14 Presents video. So here's a basic block diagram that kind of displays all the functionality and all the component blocks that are going to end up on the circuit board itself. We have our four phones that we're going to use to communicate with, and all that analog communication happens over these two lines right here. These are the red and green lines in your, your phone system, tip and ring. Okay, we're going to call that the party line. In a normal state, these relays, K1, 2, 3, and 4, are not energized. And in their default state, the phone is connected through that relay to the party line on each four lines. Now power to those phones is provided from this current source. This creates the current loop, okay, and each one of these phones, when it's connected and off hook, then it's going to draw a certain amount of current from that line. And in the analog communication, if we're talking over the microphone, uh, will show up here as an analog voltage riding on that signal. And we can look at that on the oscilloscope and we'll do that in a second. The other part of the circuit that's connected to each relay comes from the ring generator, okay? And when nothing's going on, the ring generator is off, okay? If we're not pressing any keys on the keypad, the ring generator is off, and there is no AC signal on here that would actuate the ringers in these phones. Now, if I pick up the phone, I'm off hook, I'm drawing current on K2 here from the current source. Now, if I press a button, say 8 here, this should ring this phone over here. Okay, so on the DTMF decoder side, this is always monitoring the party line for a DTMF tone. So when I press 8, whatever filters it stores has in here compares what we're receiving to that value. We get a data valid signal as long as it detects a DTMF tone. Now I've tied that to the output enable here, which will enable the latches, okay? Because normally they're in a high impedance state, essentially out of circuit. When this goes high from this data valid signal, it allows these latches to operate. And depending on whatever button I press, one, two, four, eight, one of these will go high. These signals will energize this relay, this enable relay, turning the ring generator circuit on, okay? So it feeds our ring voltage, AC ring voltage, along this line here to each individual relay. Now because I'm pressing eight, it detected that signal, IO8 here is gonna go high, which energizes this relay. It's gonna switch that signal, this phone over from the party line to the ring signal. When that happens, this detects the ring, makes the sound, okay? When I release that button, then this guy turns off, the ring generator turns off, this relay switches back over to the party line. The user can then lift the phone, and then we have a conversation between the two phones. It's that simple. So let's look at each individual circuit in a little more detail. Now we're gonna set up a current loop with this basic system here, and all it is is telephone number one, in series with telephone number two, which is in series with a battery, and that's in series with a current limit resistor. Here I'm using a value of 330 ohms. Now when we speak into the phone, it modulates the voltage along this line, and we can actually measure, if we connect it to an oscilloscope, the AC fluctuations, uh, the voltage that's developed across this 330 ohm resistor. Let's check it out real quick. So I'll take one end of my probe, my negative lead, take my positive lead here, let's put that back on hook, and check it out on the oscilloscope. And now you can really see the voltage fluctuations and the voltage that's developed across that 330 ohm resistor. 
Now I'm going to show you how we're going to use a current source in place of that battery and resistor in series, and I'll show you how we can connect more than just two phones to this phone line. Okay, so now you can see that I have my four phones all wired up to these four phone jacks all in parallel. Now, it's being fed by this current source here, and it can provide up to 50 milliamps. Now this is something that I built in as a separate project, but essentially uh, it uses an LM317 to create a current limited source, all right? And we're able to change the resistor values to limit the maximum amount of current. Now in this case with four phones, 50 milliamps is enough to make them operate. So right now when they're on hook, they're all out of circuit, so essentially removed from the system. When I take one of the phones off the hook, you can see that the current jumps up because this phone is now in circuit. Now, because we're not using that 9 volt battery, we have a little bit more power, more current to work with. The DTMF functionality now works, whereas before it did not. So now I'm able to pick up all the phones and we can all have a conversation together. I know you can't hear that, but uh, we will take a closer look at that in a little bit. So there's a little circuit board in here and we're going to put this into our circuit. This will be our current source that will drive everything. Now that we have all of our phones wired up to these jacks here, let's go ahead and test our ringer circuitry. All right, things are starting to look a little busy here. Stay with me. Uh, we have the same circuit as before. All of our phone jacks are wired in parallel. We have a voltmeter that's now connected to this measuring AC volts. And we have our variac here that's going to slowly increase our voltage as we turn this knob so we can find out what the ring voltages of these phones actually are. So I suspect that uh, the digital phones are probably going to ring earlier because I know for a fact that they don't require as much voltage to trigger the ringer circuit inside of here. This guy is also electronic, so it will probably be about the same as this. And I know that this one has an electromechanical ringer with two bells in it. That requires a little bit more juice to get it going. Now, phone systems are supposed to oscillate at from 75 to 90 volts AC with a 20 hertz uh, AC signal. Um, I'm running this right off of 60 hertz, so this one may not actually ring. We'll see what happens. So I'm going to slowly bring it up and watch the voltmeter here. 5, 10, 15, 25, 30. So at 30 volts, these two are ringing. This one has not rung yet. Let's bring it up a little bit past 30. Okay. So about 32, 33 volts, this one started ringing. This one hasn't done anything yet. So I'm going to disconnect these phones so they don't make any noise, and we'll see where this older style phone starts to ring at 40 I can hear the electromechanical solenoid moving 50 60 70 80 so we're getting to the 90 volt standard so 90 volts is where it starts actually moving and you could tell that frequency was really high because it was just ringing really, really quickly. So I don't want the voltage to be that high. Obviously, that's kind of a dangerous range. If you have digital phones like this, then I think 30 volts AC would probably work fine. This one too, a little bit 35 volts. Your older mechan electromechanical style phones are going to require a little bit more punch to get that uh, those bells jingling. Um, so this is going to be a little bit more of a complicated circuit. We're going to have to move over to the breadboard to prototype basically an AC inverter from our 5 volt supply. The brains of this whole project is the Haltech HT9170 DTMF receiver or detector as it's more commonly referred to. Its basic function is to take the DTMF tones generated from your phone during a key press event and convert it to a 4-bit digital value. This is a perfect choice for our project because we're interested in dialing up specific phones with a single press of a button. The HT9170 operates from 2.5 to 5 volts DC, uses a common 3.57 MHz color burst crystal, and has a tri-state output which will be useful to us in this application. On the front end of this chip, there's an op amp that allows you to set the gain or amplification of the incoming audio and uses internal band split and notch filters to detect the DTMF tones. But before we get into all that, let's look at exactly what DTMF tones actually are. DTMF stands for Dual Tone Multifrequency, and all that means is that two tones or frequencies are produced with each individual key press. Here you can see the organization of those groups of frequencies. Along the rows, going horizontally, these are known as the low group, and that ranges from 697 to 941 hertz. The columns going vertically range from 1209 to 1477 hertz so that when we press, for example, digit 1, both frequencies 697 and 1209 are produced at the same time. 
hence the term dual tone. Now, if we look at that on the oscilloscope using the FFT or fast Fourier transform function, we can take the time domain signal at the top here and plot a frequency domain signal, simply meaning that we can observe the frequency along the x-axis and the amplitude along the y-axis. When I press the one digit, you can see that there are two spikes which represent the dual frequencies of 697 and 1209 hertz. The HT9170 receiver chip uses its internal filters to isolate these two frequencies. It then runs the signal through a zero crossing detector to calculate the frequencies. If it matches a hard coded value stored in memory, it then says, hey, we received a digit one. Let's send a binary value of one to the output latches. We can then use these digital output signals to drive our relays connected to each phone and make them ring. Now in order to ring individual phones, we need to look for digit presses that produce only one high signal. These would be key presses 1, 2, 4, and 8. This makes sense because converting these decimal values to binary values sets only those discrete bits. Now if the user understood the layout of the circuit and was good at converting decimal to binary, then they could ring multiple phones at the same time. But unfortunately, my daughters both fell asleep when I started to explain hexadecimal numbers. Here's a Haltech HT9170 uh, SOP18 package. So it's a surface mount package. In order to breadboard something like this, you really need to use one of these adapter boards. And this comes from uh, Aries. Again, it's a SOP20 package. This um, IC is actually 18 pin, not 20. So you can see I'm not actually using these last two pins. Now, another thing that I like to do when I'm using a microcontroller um, and breadboarding it is I like to take the crystal and solder it directly to the pins as close to the chip as possible because if you have the leads going down into the breadboard, uh, the metal contacts inside can actually cause some kind of parasitic uh, reactive uh, components like capacitance and inductance that can actually change the frequency of this a little bit. Usually a problem with higher frequency crystals, this one's probably not a problem, but it is common practice and uh, something that I like to do. So on the analog side of the IC, uh, we have all these resistors and some coupling capacitors that connect to our party line. Now we need to set the gain properly so that the signal, the DTMF signal coming in, is not clipping or not too low. So the values that were in the data sheet, the gain was actually a little bit too high at three. So I ended up reducing this to like one and a half, um, just so it wasn't clipping. So it wasn't actually detecting the DTMF tones until I set the gain properly. Um, so the values I have corrected in the schematic. Now on the output side where normally I'd connect some relays, I've connected some LEDs. So I'll show you how it operates. Let me get the phone off hook. Now, these are weighted binary values, right? So we have one, two, four, and eight. So if I press one on the phone, you'll see that LED lights up. If I press two, the next one lights up. If I press four, the four bit lights up. And eight, the eight bit lights up. Now I can ring multiple phones um, at the same time also. So if I wanna light up these two phones, I would uh, add these two together, one and two, that would be three. If I wanted to light up these three, it would be um, the equivalent of a seven, so four plus two plus one. If I press seven, there we go. So when I breadboard something, I will not breadboard the things that I've already done in the past that I know that work. Um, so I haven't used this yet. And the other thing I haven't done is I have not tested out this ringer circuitry. So the ringer circuitry basically revolves around a transformer, basically a 10 to one or 12 to one ratio. And what we're doing is we're not using it as a normal transformer. So this is 120 volts to uh, believe this one is 18 volts, center tapped. Instead of using this as this side as the primary, okay, we're using the opposite side, what would normally be the secondary, we're using it as the primary. So we're stepping the voltage up instead of stepping the voltage down. Now when using a transformer like this, you wanna make sure that the winding resistance is not too low. In this case, it's about three and a half to four ohms. So if you were to use a transformer that had a higher current capability, it would have a lower resistance, therefore it would draw more current from your power supply. And I did experiment with a couple different transformers and this one was the most successful. Uh, so I would definitely go with a transformer that has a lower current rating of like 300, 400, 450 milliamp output capability. That ensures that your winding resistance is a little bit higher. Therefore, you're not draining too much current on your power supply. When I tried that before, it was inducing a lot of noise on the telephone and I couldn't even hear what was being said on the other end. This one works perfectly. So what we're doing is we're using a CD4047 a CMOS um, multivibrator. So it basically creates a square wave um, and we select the resistor and capacitor values to oscillate at about 30 hertz. So telephones ring from about 20 hertz to 60 hertz. But again, you don't want the frequency to be too low because your transformer will saturate and uh, will not work properly. 
So we have two outputs that are driving the gates of our MOSFETs here. We have a Q and a Q naught signal. One side goes high, the other side goes low, and then when the oscillator flips over, those change state. So they're always flip-flopping. That drives the gate of these, and when the gate is enabled, you know, one side, one leg goes high, the other one goes low, and then they just flip back and forth, kind of approximating a sine wave. Now our, our center tap is connected to our positive rail, which kind of gives us a reference in the middle. On what we're calling our secondary side now, we have to install a capacitor because there's some pretty massive overshoot if we don't do that. And there's a lot of noise that gets induced into our circuit. So here I'm using a 2.2 microfarad, 200 volt, oh sorry, this is a 100 volt capacitor. And without this, it just doesn't operate properly. So we need to snub those uh, overshoots, that ringing on the uh, edges of our, our, our square wave. Now, in addition to that, before we were using it, that large box, which was our current source, uh, in this case, we're just using the LM317 and a 22 ohm resistor uh, to current limit the supply that uh, feeds these blue wires here, which is our party line. Now, I'm using this uh, Recom switching regulator in place of a uh, 7805 linear regulator because linear regulators get really hot when we apply a lot of voltage. This guy we can apply up to 28 volts and it will po power all of our 5 volt circuitry quite efficiently at like 80% so we don't waste a lot of energy as heat. That's basically it. So I think now it's time to bring all of these components over to an actual circuit board. As far as construction goes, I think I'm gonna add all the electrical components to one board. The second board, I will just put the phone jacks on and those will all be connected to this steel enclosure here so that these jacks all line up over here. All right, so we spent a lot of time talking about all the individual components. Now let's talk about the schematic in case you guys want to build this on your own. Dude, this camera trick's been done so many times. This was your idea. Show them the schematic. Here's a schematic. All right, so what's going to feed all of our 5-volt uh, ICs here, our CD44-7 and our um, DTMF detector is this voltage regulator right here. So we can feed it up to 28 volts uh, because we're using a switch mode regulator, which is the uh, Recom 78E 5.0 1.0, which is 5 volts, 1 amp. And we just have a couple of capacitors here on the input and output to help filter things out. Moving on, we need to supply a current loop to our party line, and that is provided by this LM. This says 117, but it's actually a 317. Um, we can feed the 24 volts in from the raw side of this, uh, our 5 volt regulator here. And uh, this current limit resistor sets up our current source. So it's the reference voltage inside of this guy, 1.25 divided by our resistance, which gives us approximately 75 milliohms out, which is enough to run all of our phones. Those are connected to party lines, what we're calling A and B. Also connected to our party line on uh, A and B, we have this um, differential input, okay, like we talked about earlier, our operational amplifier and all of the values that set the gain. I've gone ahead and updated these values so they should all be correct. We have our color burst crystal and our two capacitors going to ground. And that's the analog side. The digital side, um, we have our output enable, which enables all the digital outputs connected back to our data valid signal. So when we do a key press, it detects those uh, two frequencies. The signal goes high. This drives the output enable high. And then these latches work. This is part of our steering circuit, this resistor and capacitor that controls the key press and how quickly it uh, detects those signals. Um, our data valid signal uh, will drive the relay that controls our switch mode supply. So we're simply uh, driving the base with a one kilo ohm resistor, which puts this guy into saturation or cutoff, turning on this relay or turning off the relay. That provides power to our CD4047. And uh, like I said earlier, the RC time constant here determines the frequency. And then we have our Q and Q naught signals that drive the gates of these two MOSFETs. That drives what we're calling our primary side here. And the center tap is connected to our five volt rail. Now, I don't want this thing on all the time because uh, it just makes me uncomfortable having a moderately high voltage at around 75 volts running all the time. These MOSFETs don't really get too hot. They just get a little bit warm to the touch. Um, so I've elected to turn them on and off with that data valid signal coming from our uh, DTMF detector. Now this is the digital side of things and this is what switches our phone lines from, phone, from the party line over to the uh, ring signal. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in since these are all basically redundant, okay? We'll look at one of them. So look at D0 here. So if we press one, this D0 signal will actually go high. That's going to drive this base of the transistor, okay, with a certain amount of current that puts it into saturation and it will energize this relay. Okay, so normally it's connected to the party line over here, this signal and this signal, okay? When we energize it, 
it switches over to the ring line, which are these two signals here. And that's basically it. So the phone switches between the party line and the ring line. Here's our telephone here, these two signals. And then we're able to either have a conversation or that ring signal that was uh, enabled earlier and we'll make the telephone actually ring. Of course, we have our freewheeling diode here that sits across these two terminals on the coil. So when we de-energize it, any voltage uh, that is due to the collapse of that magnetic field doesn't damage this transistor. It's just a measure of protection. All these other circuits that you see here are exactly the same as this one we just talked about. So D0, 1, 2, and 3 has its own sub-circuit, 1, 2, and 3 up here. All right, so we were able to take some pretty basic components here and create a four line telephone intercom system with uh, some dialing capabilities using a DTMF decoder chip. Now, I'm excited about this project. I've been thinking about it for a long time. I told my kids about it and they've been relentlessly harassing me for the past two months to actually build this thing. It's late at night, they're in the rooms. Uh, I finally completed it. Um, so I'm gonna give them a call. There's a phone in one of my kids' rooms right now, and uh, I don't know if they're aware if, that it's in there or not, but uh, I'm gonna try dialing them up right now. And I'll use my lav mic so that you can hear what they're saying. I think it's line two. Hello? Hi? Who's this? It's Riley. Hey, how you doing? What number am I? You're on number two. You're line number two. I think I'm number eight. I'm not. I'm not sure though. Is Listen. it okay if Cindy can talk to you? Yes, but don't tell her, okay? I'm gonna. I'm gonna sneak it in her room, and then we're gonna do her next, okay? Okay. See right. you in mm -hmm. auto. Bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs> okay, that worked pretty well. So let's call my other daughter. Ring, ring, ring. Hello. Who is this? This is your dad. Hello. How are you? Good. What do you think of this phone system here? I think it's great. All right. I know you don't want to talk to me. You want to talk to your sister, right? All right, I'll set up the phones in your rooms, okay? Okay. All right, love you. Yeah. Bye. Well, I think that was a pretty big success. Now, if I had a little more time, um, I, now that I have a feel for how the DTMF circuitry interacts with the other phones on the line, I would probably add a microcontroller to the digital outputs uh, to perform more advanced functions like uh, multi-digit phone numbers, um, custom rings and things of that nature. Uh, but overall, I'm really happy with the way this turned out. It'll be entertaining for the kids, and if I end up wiring it into my house phone system, then it'll be a useful way for me to communicate quickly between floors. Yes, even in the age of modern smartphones. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Do you have any cool telephone projects or hacks that you've done in the past? Or maybe you'd just like to open up a discussion about this project? Let us know on the Element 14 community at element14.com presents. We'll see you next time.